God's wisdom should be passed down from father to son. What do you think or believe about that statement? What of this idea that God has designed the family and he has designed fathers to pass down his truth from one generation to the next? And that this is centerpiece of really how God created man. He created the family as the learning institute where his word would be passed from one generation to the next. And you might say, well, Pastor Ben, where do you get that from Proverbs 4? Well, notice verse 1. Hear, O sons, a father's instruction. Now, this is interesting because this is Solomon. Solomon is who? He's the king of Israel. He doesn't say, O subjects. He doesn't say, hey, you who are my sons, listen to your king. He addresses them as his sons and he as their father. Out of all his titles and all his might and all his power, he addresses them as a father, a son. And is it not also very interesting that when Jesus comes, he says, I come to do the will of my father. That God is relational as a father is relation to his child and seeks to instruct, instruct them and grow. That God designed the family to be what is best for the child and where his truth would be taught and understood. Families are for discipleship. Notice Solomon doesn't even say as the church. He says as a father. Now certainly the church as a gathering of believers, right, do discipleship and do discipleship together. But ultimately, this might be a shock to some of you, it's actually not the job of the church to disciple your child. It is actually your job to do that and the church to come alongside you and help you and enable you to do that well. That doesn't mean churches shouldn't have programs like Sunday school or Awanas or things of that nature. I'm all for those things. But if you think that simply dropping your child off is you doing your job, you, you, missed, you missed the point. You missed it. Discipleship needs to be taking place in the home. That is where it's most effective. And so as we look at Psalms, or Psalms, excuse me, Proverbs chapter 4 this morning, we see first, the first thing we're going to see is that, Dad, God holds you responsible to teach and to disciple your children. One day you will stand before God and you'll have to give an account of how you interacted with your children and what you attempted to teach and lead them in. And so the question is, are you going to disciple your children and lead them in the benefits of wisdom? Are you going to disciple and teach them in the which path in life to choose? Which is the right path? And in that path, in that righteous path, how do you walk? How do you walk in the righteous path? Are you going to be intentional with your children and your family? Because I tell you what, somebody else is. Disney would love to. TikTok and Facebook, they'd love to. You know, your school would love to. But the question is, are you going to do it? And I'm not here saying that you can never watch a, a Disney movie, though I would strongly, you know, tell you to take caution against the newer ones, and I'm not saying you can't send your kid even to public school. But the point is here, who are you going to take responsibility for what your kids are learning? And so we see here, so dads, God holds you responsible to teach. So hear, O sons, of father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. And so we see that God really ultimately has given the father this authority in the family. And I do mean authority. Because you cannot have learning unless you have somebody in authority instructing somebody under authority. Like Jesus even said, right, a student 
becomes who? Like his teacher, right? And so you, th there's, th there's this authority aspect that goes with teaching because the reason I also say this is because how does Solomon start? He says, here, right? Put down the phone, put down the iPad, stop goofing around, stop what you're doing, look at me, open your ears, listen to what I have to say. And don't just kind of stare at me because I'm not going to let you do anything else. But he says, and be attentive that you may gain insight. So don't just look like you're listening. Actually listen. Right? And why would you listen to somebody? Because they have something important to say that is a benefit to you. And so with that comes authority. And we know with little kids sometimes, a squat on the rear done biblically, right? In the proper way. And in love and in kindness, sometimes helps focus. Because their children in need to learn, right? They're wonderful, lovely gifts from God. But we know, just like us, they're born what? Sinners, right? Sinners begat what? Sinners. Right? And so, out of love for them, we want to instruct them in the proper way. So, we have here, as we continue, Solomon says, For I give you good precepts, do not forsake my teaching. So he's giving him good precepts, he's giving him good instruction, teaching. Where does Solomon get these things from? He gets them from the Lord. Which means that what? As fathers, we need to what? Be readers of God's Word. If you're not a reader, that's fine, but you should be a reader of the Bible. There's no excuse. We are called to know God's Word. Now, I think it's good to read in general, but some of us have jobs or professions or we're just not much into reading other books. The, for those of you who are that way, you have a wealth of practical knowledge that would, when taken with Scripture and applied to the real world, you have a wealth of knowledge for your child to instruct them in all sorts of things. So please don't fail to miss that. Now Solomon's moving on, verse 3, he says, When I was a son with my father, tender and only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me and said to me, Let your heart hold fast to my words. And so, in order for us, we need to show that we can be under authority too. And Solomon does this by going back to stating the point of who his father was, and that when his daddy came to him and said, Son, you need to listen to what I have to say because it's very important. He said, I listen. Now, some of you may not have had a good father. Or maybe he just was never around and you never really knew him. You still have a heavenly father, don't you? But you can say, listen, I have learned this from my heavenly father. And so I want to instruct you in what he has taught me. Okay, And you're also showing what? That you are under authority. That you listen to the people that God's put into your life who have authority over you. And so you are now modeling an example of what you want your child to do with you. And so there comes that added aspect of modeling. And so Solomon is giving his sons this example of follow my example. Because I submitted myself to the teaching of my dad, I'm asking you to do the same. Okay, And this actually comes back to bite Solomon a little bit, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But notice something else he says here. He says, he taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast. See, really the goal of parenting discipleship is to what? Not just get your kids to behave the way you want them to. It's to get to their heart who they are, what they think, what they desire, what they want most in life. Because you can put all the physical restraints from the time they are born to the time they're 18, and they might hate it. Now, they might comply and make you feel good because that's what they have to do. But when they're 18, woohoo, I'm out of here. Because their heart isn't there. And so the goal is 
getting to the child's heart, his place of understanding and thinking and desiring. And that is much harder than just saying, don't do that or else. That also means time. Because a child generally does reveal their heart to their parents, but you have to be able to take the time to be with it. Because children don't work on your watch. I know mine don't. Some of them like to talk when they're supposed to be in bed about important things. Like, we had all day, we could have talked about this. Now you got to be careful because, you know, they'll learn and they'll try to take advantage of it. But you have to listen to what they're saying, right? You know, sometimes there are big important things and, and they us talk to it when it's very, about it when it's inconvenient. Because that's when their hearts are ready. And so those are just, those are just aspects of parenting. And that's why I like this quote by Ted Tripp. He says, if authority best describes the parent's relationship to the child, the best description of the activity of the parent is the child's God. This shepherding process helps a child to understand himself and the world which he lives. The parent shepherds as a child to assess himself and his responses. He shepherds the child to understand not just the what of the child's actions, but also the why. As the shepherd, you want to help your child understand himself as a creature made by God for God. And that's true. You want your child to understand, why did I hit my sister? Now for boys, I always find that really easy. Because I wanted what she had, so I squatted her. In other words, I wanted what I wanted, and I care more about what I want than I do my siblings. That's I love it when, it, especially the young ones, when they're blunt like that. They don't even realize how blunt and selfish that sounds because they're not old enough to realize that yet. But it's nice because it tells you where their heart is. As they get older, and I'm sorry, ladies, you're just harder. There's just a lot more stuff to work through. We get there, and you get there with the daughters. The ways I just find they tend to be a lot more simple. Like, girls, she might act out over here, but there's other stuff over here that's what's really bothering her. Where boys are just jerks. <laughs> <laughs> we're simpler, but we're just selfish. Like, it just boils down to, ah, I'm selfish and I want it. You know, we're up a lot more. Food. So, difference between the sexes. <laughs> Alright, so we see that this, this hole's there, and so now we're going to move into um, Solomon is going to essentially. He is telling his children, his sons, what his father, King David, told him. Right? So, my dad said, these are the benefits of wisdom, and I'm going to pass on the benefits of wisdom to you, and why you should listen to the wise words I have for you. So, verse 5. He tells them, get wisdom, get insight, do not forget, and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. And so, we just have this, and you're going to see this a lot in chapter 4, and really throughout Psalms. So I was like, why does Solomon stress over and over again, particularly within the first uh, six or ten chapters of Proverbs, listen to what I have to say, listen to what I have to say, I know what I'm talking about, listen to wisdom, get wisdom. I mean, it is bam, 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 bam. Why? Because the first lesson any child needs to learn is obedience. If you want to experience freedom in your life, you must learn first to be under authority. Otherwise, your sin and your passion will run a wild and enslave you. And so we must learn to be self-controlled. Then we can experience true freedom and liberty. Uh, we can talk about that with Financial Peace University, right? There are people who have become enslaved to their finances with debt and other things, where if they learned discipline and obedience in the beginning, they would have so much more freedom now. Right, so that's just an example. So what are these benefits? Well, the first one is at the end of verse 4. Keep my commandments and live. Life. How many people overdose, drink themselves to death, acquire all kinds of other diseases through other ungodly practices? Right? You can 
Because you don't follow wisdom, you, you could literally end up killing yourself early. Practice even things as simple as a healthy lifestyle, right? The things you eat can lead to an early grave. And so we, it can literally bring life, but this is, I think, even bigger than that. We're talking here about spiritual life, right? True wisdom is the wisdom that is found in Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And what he has done for me. And eternal life that that brings. And release from judgment. And that might actually, following Jesus and obtaining eternal life, might actually lead to bodily death, at least for some people in some places of our world, even to death. Right? But it brings true life. And so wisdom brings life. We see that we're to not forsake her. And, and notice here too, there, there's always this thing. Solomon tells you, don't forsake, don't leave wisdom, don't do this, and then it will be this. Okay? You can't just assent, hey, I think wisdom's a good idea, but I'm not going to actually do anything that's wise. That, that, that doesn't work that way. Okay? You actually have to pursue wisdom. Get wisdom, get insight, do not forget, do not turn, your, turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will keep you. Right? Just like life, she'll keep you safe from harms and tragedies that come with making bad, unwise decisions. We see that um, the beginning of wisdom is this, to get wisdom. That might seem a bit redundant, but it kind of makes sense, right? The first step of being wise is what realizing what? I'm unwise. And so I need to get it. I need to pursue it. I need to find it. And whatever you get, get inside. Prize her highly, and then, right, so you have to realize, you have to humble yourself and realize you need wisdom. You need to pursue it. You need to go after insight. And you need to prize it highly, which means it's a priority in your life. Bible reading is a priority in your life over other things. Bible reading with the whole family is a priority in your life over other things. It means other things aren't going to get done, whatever those other things are. Because this is more valuable than that. And that's the problem. And I, I'm, you, all of you know how much I like sports and playing sports. But that's a thing. Are sports a higher priority than God? Because which things do we do more, and which thing, if it comes to push or shove, wins over the other one? Right? And when that happens, what are you teaching your kids? Which one is most valuable? Christ her highly, and she will do what? Exalt you. When you make good decisions, other people notice. Right? Like a good businessman. Other people are like, hey, man, you're really good at business. You know, and they give you a lot of honor, right? Wisdom exalts you. Making good decisions, people see you as somebody as to look up to or somebody who has answers. Right? So there's exaltation that comes with wisdom. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a graceful garland. And this has the idea, uh, at least from what I can tell and what I researched, as uh, the Greeks, right, they would have their Olympic Games and you'd get a wreath on your head. And so that's the idea of someone who's, who's, who's run their race and they get their reward, their wreath on their head, along with, she will bestow on you a beautiful crown. Right, so, so there's blessing, there's honor, there's uplifting, there's uh, positions of esteem and honor that come from Fan Wei Wisdom. And of course we know Right, that God is a rewarder of those who diligently serve Him, right? And so there's the eternal rewards that come from wisdom. While the world laughs at us for following God because they, sit, because they think all that there is to live for is this life, we are the ones who truly possess wisdom in knowing that there is a life to come. And so we're preparing, which is a wise thing, right? If there is life after death, and there are things that you do in this life that affect what happens then. Doesn't it make sense to be doing those things that will be most beneficial for you in the next life? 
So since there is, because God clearly says there is life after death, and since God says the way to, there's going to be a heaven and a hell, and the only way to heaven is through Jesus, so it would be wise then to follow Jesus, even if that means we do what? Lose all earthly possessions and everybody else thinks we're stupid. Because when we get to eternity, right, then everything flips around. And so even in our world, wisdom is not always what it seems. As we talked about at the beginning of our series on wisdom for this year, there are many, sadly, wisdom is just not found in our culture today. It's just not there. Which makes it all the more important for fathers to instruct their children in wisdom. So we see benefits of wisdom. Now, part of wisdom is knowing which path in life to choose. Now, notice in verse 10, he starts over again with, Hear my son, accept my words, that the years of your life may be many. See, so this idea of life again. He, uh, he gives an example again um, of himself. I have taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in the paths of righteousness. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered, and if you run, you will not stumble, right? Notice again, what does he say? I have shown you, son, what is the right way to go. This is very important. If you're going to lead your children in the way of wisdom, you, you have to do what? If you're going to lead them in the right path, you have to what? You have to walk in the path in front of them. That's what it means to lead. You can't be walking in this path and telling him that he should be walking in that path. It does not work. I can't tell you how many people I've actually talked to who don't go to church, and one of the strange reasons they give is that it's not just that their parents didn't go to church, but their parents dropped them off for Sunday school and the church service, and then they would come pick them up. Right? Hey, you need this, but I don't. So when they get to adults, well, they don't stay. Right? And that's another thing in our culture today. We now, leadership in leading the way is, is seen as a place of importance and power. It's not seen as actually leading people in the right way. Right? Gone are the days, right, when Lee turns to General Longstreet in the Civil War and says, Hey, in the battle coming up, I need you to stay back because I can't lose you. To which Longstreet says, I can't lead from behind. Right? You have to lead from the front. And that is, as parents, if we want our kids to follow after God, then that means we have to follow after God. And it really falls, and this is where Solomon fails in some ways, because remember when he marries all the foreign women, and then he worships the gods, and then what does his son do? His son does what? Um, I'm going to reject the really good advice of my dad's, of the guys that work with my dad, and I'm going to take the really crummy advice. He didn't say he didn't think it just way in his head, right? I'm going to take the really crummy advice of all my buddies who are dumb and don't know anything, right? And then he ends up losing the kingdom. Now it's decreed by God that that would happen, but it kind of happens right down to Solomon's judgment, right? Hey, you didn't follow me. You're going to lose the kingdom. And it comes by the wisest man who ever lived's son ends up doing something really dumb. I mean, think of the irony there. Because why? Because Solomon didn't follow God with his whole heart. And so the challenge is for us is to follow God and to follow Him in the right path. So in verse 13, keep hold of instruction, do not let it go. Guard her, for she is your life. Now 14. Do not enter the path of the wicked. Do not walk in the way of the evil. Avoid it. Do not go into it. Turn away from it. Pass on. Alright, so we have a pathway, which is in life, right? So like we have, it's like having two roadways. We'll see. There's a righteous road, and there's a wicked road. Okay? And you can choose which way to go in your life. So it's the direction of your life. Alright? Notice all of Solomon's strong warnings 
against the pathway of the wicked. Notice, he says, do not enter. He says, do not walk in it. He says, avoid it. He says, don't go into it. He says, turn away from it. And he says, pass by it. Six times! And that's a pretty strong warning. That goes to not just don't enter, but if you've started down that road, stop and turn around. Okay? Do not pursue the path of the wicked. Like Solomon cannot be stronger in his warning. Don't go that route. It doesn't lead to good things. Now what we're going to see then, so what does that pathway look like? What does the pathway of the wicked look like? Right? Because I'm going to tell you, the pathway of the wicked doesn't have a big sign above it saying, this is the pathway of the wicked. Please stay away. Okay? It's like evil dictators don't walk around and say, I'm an evil dictator. Right? It just doesn't happen that way. So, what does it look like? Well, verse 16. So these are people who are walking in the pathway of the wicked. For they cannot sleep unless they have done wrong. Right? So they literally lose sleep at night, night if they haven't done something wicked. They say, well, well, that seems kind of weird. Who does that? Who, who's like, oh, I can't fall asleep and I didn't murder anybody today. Like, who does that? that? What I think it's really speaking to, to is something else. It is sinful lusts and desires. Okay? Like the drug addict, right? They might not feel normal. They may not feel normal or comfortable for a long time unless they have their addictive substance, right? Maybe they can't even sleep. Gambling addicts, porn addicts, right? It's, I have to have it. I need to have this release, right? So that I can relax. And so in a real way, they're already living in hell, right? Because hell is a place of always craving and wanting and never being able to find satisfaction. And that's where they are. And then there's also this. They are robbed of sleep unless they have made someone stumble. Now, there's the obvious one that we could, you know, there's the you know, teenage boy on the bus who's teaching bad words to the, you know, eight-year-old on the bus. That's not good. But I think you also see this in our world today, just, just with the pornography industry. Like, yes, since the internet, it's always been there. But the sad thing is now, is it pursues young men. Right? They're not even looking for it, and it pops up here in an ad, and it pops up there in an ad, and, and, and sex is used to sell everything. Right? Always just looking to start someone down that path. Now, if you listen to sports talk shows, uh, what, what was one of the big things they're always advertising, right? Is gambling, sports betting. Right? Hey, you can sign up on this website for sports gambling, and hey, the first $1,000 loss is on us. Aren't they so kind? And then you're hooked forever. Right? Unless they make somebody stumble, they can't stop. And this is the pathway to wicked. Notice verse 17. For they eat the bread of wickedness. So what is it? Like, is there like a bread you buy at Walmart, right? That says wickedness on it, and they eat that? Like, well, what's with that? Well, what is Christ, right? When we take communion, right? He is... Right? He says, this is my body. Right? So there's this idea that Christ spiritually, his words, right? he is the word of life, that when we dwell in him and he is our spiritual substance, right? we become like Christ. And, that, and the same idea is here. Right? Those who eat wickedness, right? wickedness is what their soul consumes. Okay? Instead of going to God's word and meditating on scripture and prayer and reading good books and spending wholesome family time and, and, and with good friendships and going to church, these people, they rather, they rather fill their souls with wickedness. Right? I remember we cleaned out and we bought that place over on Moore Hill, the attic. So we cleaned out the attic and there was an entire pickup truck load, and I mean load, like books falling off full of romance novels. 
I pity the brain and the mind that had to consume all of those. Right? You're, what are you filling your heart with? Right? They live on wickedness. And of course, drink the wine of violence, I think, has that same connotation, right? Now, this doesn't necessarily even mean that they're out murdering or causing strife all the time, but we see that, right? We have, like ancient Rome, created the welfare state, and so we have the welfare mobs that, you know, they don't get bread or have enough circuses, they go and they ride the streets, and the emperor gets scared and runs off and all kinds of crazy stuff. But what were some of the things they entertained the Roman populace with, what, right? The games, right? Are some of our modern movies that far removed? We, we, you know, we can justify it now because they're actors and nobody's really dying. But watching a guy get obliterated on the screen and being like, that is awesome, is that really the right attitude we're supposed to have? And I'm not, you know, I actually think historical movies, I think there's a great value to them. And of course, a lot, and when you're trying to tell a story, you know, showing the real reality. But I really struggle with our over gorization of things in our culture. And I really struggle with the fact of why do I, like, it's one thing to go and, and like the story for the story's sake and understand the struggle, but it's another thing to be like, that guy just got blown into a billion pieces. That's so awesome. Why is that awesome? That should be disturbing. And so this is the pathway of the wicked. Now, notice here we have, but the path of the righteous is like a light of dawn which shines brighter and brighter to full day. And then we have also the path of the wicked. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. How true that is. They don't even understand. They think other people who are following right are really the crazy wicked people. They, their minds are so twisted because they walk in darkness as opposed to the light. And believe me, it makes a difference. I remember, I was done a few years now, but I was training with my cousin Adam. I wasn't training, he was training, but he was going to do his first 100 miles, and so we were running the Royal Sock Trail at night to get practice. And, you know, if the light, and you have like, you have like a headlamp, and you got these lamps on your hands and stuff, and so we're running along. And every time I thought I got this fairly decent and I put the light up so it wasn't shining directly on the path, I would trip and fall on my face. <laughs> right? And, see, that's the difference. God and His Word <coughs> is the light that helps us to see what is right and wrong and understand the world around us. Otherwise, we're in darkness and we're just guessing. Our final aspect we want to look at here is is what does it actually look like to walk in the path of the righteous? So it's light, so we can see, but what else? So again, verse 20, he's starting over with this saying, hey, my son, listen to me. My son, be attentive to my words, incline your ears to my saying. So I know we're getting near the end, but hold on a little bit longer. Be attentive to this message. We're, we're getting there. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart. Again, this emphasis on the heart. For they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. And now we get a bit of a picture of what this pathway of the righteous looks like. Keep your heart with all vigilance. For from it flows the springs of life. But what's your heart? It's where you think. It's where your desires are. It's where your feelings are. Who you are. Your soul. And really, no matter what we might believe up, say we believe up here and give intellectual account to, our actions are a reflection of what's going on in here. So I can say that I believe this, but if I do this thing over here that contradicts it, it means deep in my heart I'm not really believing this. It's who I am as a person. Because from my heart flows life. You might like to fix things and do things with your hands. And that's in your heart. So what are you? You're a carpenter. You're a construction worker, right? You might be like me. You like to think, 
you like to think in danger. So that's what you do, right? You preach, right? Those, right, because of who, who I am here, comes out in my action. And so I have to keep vigilant watch over what's in here, because that's going to affect what I do with my life. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk from you. So crooked, the devious, sneaky speech here. Right, so speak the truth. The words that come out of your mouth, again, reflect what's in here. So don't deceive people. Don't lead them astray. Let your word be your bond. Verse 25. Let your eyes look directly forward. And your gaze be straight before you. Now, I like this one, and so I kind of rephrase this verse this way. Stay focused on the cross. Right? Because this idea, if you're walking down the right path, the reality of it is there's all kinds of turnoffs. And on these turnoffs, there's all these kinds of signs that say, wonderful fun if you come this way. Wonderful fun if you come this way. So you need to be focused on what is most important. And of course, Christ, I think, bears this out in John 14, right? In John 14, 6, Jesus says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes from the Father except through me. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus, because he's the one that's going to bring you to the end. And then we have, think, about the direction of your life. So 26, ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Think. If I do this, then what happens? Right? Young people who are here, right? The decisions you make today will make who you are in the future. So think through those decisions. We do young people a terrible disservice in our culture today when we say, you know what? You guys are young, you're dumb, you're irresponsible, go enjoy life. And they're like, young people are so stupid and irresponsible. Well, yeah. I mean, we forget that a hundred years ago, these same young people were more responsible and made better decisions than most of our 30 and 40 and 50 year olds do today. Because they were expected to. And they were able to. You know, we have to stop pushing this lie that the most important thing in life for you is to have fun and goof off. Because maybe having fun and goofing off isn't what really brings true happiness and true satisfaction. Hence, we're the society that pushes it the most and we have the most suicide problems. Obviously, that's not what really makes people happy. And so if you really want what is best for a young person and what's really going to bring them fulfillment in life and real peace and real happiness, tell them you need to learn to be responsible. And they'll thank you for it someday. And our last one, verse 27. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Why? Because Jesus puts it well, right? Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Pay attention to which way you're going. There's only one way that leads to life. So ponder your path, make sure you're on that path, and stick with that path. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you.